Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first ever CFA Society Ottawa Summer Webinar Series event. My name is Sean Kulik, and I'm the president of CFA Society Ottawa. And it's my pleasure to host today's event. So thank you for joining us. 2020 has been a unique year for everyone, including our society. As we recently announced, unfortunately, we have had to postpone our annual forecast center to April 2021, as well as our annual forum to October 2021. Usually we take the summer off from programming after the full spring lineup of many in-person events, but this new abnormal has led us to rethink our program offering and thus the summer webinar series was born. Our objective over the coming weeks is to offer a bi-weekly webinar covering an interesting investment theme reflective of the current environment to allow our members and other attendees an opportunity to think through their current and future investment decisions by accessing insights from talented leaders from global investment institutions. We expect to send email updates over the coming weeks, but to tease out future topics, on August 4th, we will be discussing factor investing with an emphasis on growth versus value with Acadian Asset Management, and later in August, we'll be delving into the future of real estate from a private and public investment perspective in both debt and equity with Goldman Sachs. Today, we are joined by Jennifer Delaney from BlackRock. We'll be discussing emerging market equities. I had the pleasure of discussing EM and Frontier equities in person with Jennifer in early January prior to this new abnormal and thought she'd be well positioned to share her insights on the EM investment environment with our attendees here today. This is a live event, and Jennifer will be speaking for approximately 30 minutes. All attendees will be muted, but we would really encourage you to submit questions to the event directly in the Q&A button, not the chat button. After the completion of her remarks, I'll be asking her a few of my own questions, and then gathering and posing the best questions from the audience. I hope you all enjoy this event, and we would really appreciate you completing the survey at the end so we can continue to enhance, enhance this experience for our future webinars. So we're here today to discuss EM equities. I reviewed some historical data and found that from 1999 to 2007, EM outperformed the S&P by almost 400%, only to underperform ever since. So what does the future hold for EM? Without further ado, Jennifer, welcome to our summer webinar series and thank you for being here with us. You may now proceed. Thank you, Sean, and I'm excited to be here with everybody today. Is there any growth left in the emerging market? That's what I'm going to be addressing in our time together over the next 20, 25 minutes of prepared comments. And, mm. th in, and in three parts. The first part is addressing that exact question. Where is growth in emerging markets, if in fact there is any? The second part is a discussion on what is unique about investing in emerging market equities. And a refresher, as Sean's comments alluded to, of why we even invest in this asset class in the first place. Sometimes that can escape us when you have such a long period of underperformance. And then lastly, how is this asset class changing and evolving? And how should we think about how much exposure to emerging market equities one might want in a portfolio? So diving right in. If you open an international newspaper today, the prevailing sentiment around emerging markets, and these are some real headlines that I've seen over the last two weeks, range from coronavirus is a devastating force for emerging market equities. Coronavirus will be crushing for emerging market equities. Coronavirus, the worst scenario in history for emerging market equities. 
the prevailing sentiment today around emerging market equities is very negative. That has been illustrated by the 23 weeks of consecutive outflows we have seen from emerging market equities this year, totaling $46 billion of outflows from the asset class. So I'm going to start by laying out that bear case, which generally has two parts. The first part, and you can see this on the left-hand side, is as the story goes, COVID-19 began in China, it then spread to Europe and the US, and only now is becoming a real problem for the emerging market universe outside of China. And you know, if China, Europe, and the US struggled, how on earth can we expect some of the poorer parts of the world with less medical resources, perhaps less ability to shut down their economies, large populations, population density, and perhaps less social willingness to shut down their economies without the safety nets and stimulus that we've seen in the US and Europe in particular. The second piece of that narrative is the financial damage that that will wreck on emerging markets. And here I show just one metric, which is fiscal deficit in the emerging markets. You can see every country is in fiscal deficit, and some countries towards the bottom of this chart, significantly so, showing double digit fiscal deficit. And so the idea being that emerging markets can't cope financially from the havoc that responding to COVID will do to their economies, and that will kind of start this cycle of financial distress. So why is it that here at BlackRock, we don't ascribe to this narrative? And I'm going to walk you through why we do think there is still growth left in emerging markets, particularly being driven by China, but also an opportunity outside of China in the emerging markets. And why we actually believe, given the prevailing historical low absolute and relative valuations of this asset class, it could be a great time to actually reduce some of those underweight allocations that most people that we meet have in this asset class. So let's address what's going on in the ground in China, or on the ground in China. China is the only country, if you look at the IMS growth outlook report from a couple of weeks ago, that still has positive real GDP growth forecast for 2020. Everyone else is well in the red, but China still has a positive GDP growth expected this year. And that is due to the sharp recovery we are seeing in economic activity in China. Production got up and running first. That's been up and running now for a few months. And we, have, we saw people go back to work. We saw factories producing at full volume, it was the consumer that was more lagging in terms of getting back to a full recovery scenario. And yet where we stand today, you are back above year ago levels for everything from staples to e-commerce retailing, consumer durables, and even in services which had been lagging, things like restaurant reservations, hotel occupancy, or domestic travel, today, domestic airline travel is only 20% below year-on-year -year levels. And that compares to 60 to 90% below where it is for almost every other country that you look at. So this recovery is very, very strong, and it's happening in part due to pent-up demand 
from the lockdown that happened earlier in the year and in part due to the very strong stimulus which has been injected into the Chinese economy. Here you can see the stimulus from around the world and our estimates show that the China fiscal stimulus is about 8% of GDP which is significant on the global stage and significant for China itself from historical experience. And in our view, you're really starting to see this percolate into different areas of the real economy. It started it showing up in indicators like steel demand, cement demand, excavator sales, which was showing up 50, 60% year on year growth. And more recently, you've started to see it show up in new home sales, auto sales, and now quite significant animal spirits in the domestic stock market. In the last couple of weeks, you've seen big run up in the Asia and in the China-based equity indices, and you've seen record volume. You've had six consecutive days of over a trillion RMB equity volume in the markets, which is a record in terms of new volume that we haven't seen since 2015. So in our view, the recovery and growth drivers in China are very significant. So what does the outlook look like outside of China? And here at BlackRock on our fundamental emerging markets team, we've divided the universe into three broad categories. The first one of which China is a part includes Korea and Taiwan to deal with the coronavirus outbreak and have and are seeing recoveries and opening up of their economy. Those three countries alone account for two thirds of the emerging market index. The second bucket of countries are less well equipped to deal with the spread of COVID for a number of different reasons. And yet, in our view, our economies that are flexible enough and have enough room from a debt and fiscal perspective to be able to buffer the economies and will see a recovery. They're also the countries when, when they were selling off aggressively in February and March, we were adding capital to those countries to take advantage of that market opportunity. And that's another 15 to 20% of the emerging market universe. So that leaves us with the segment of the universe where we might agree with those headlines that we discussed right at the front. Brazil and South Africa, where you are seeing rampant COVID cases and we do think they could lead to unsustainable debt dynamics in the country. But that is a really small part of the emerging market universe. So to wrap up what we believe is the answer to this question of, is there any growth left anywhere in emerging markets? In our view, the answer is yes. There is significant growth coming from the China recovery. And there's significant opportunities in other areas of emerging markets outside of China, where you've had severe market sell offs but in our view, those economies are flexible and adaptable enough um, to be, and have room to be able to cope with the short term dislocation which the COVID crisis has presented. Let me move then to what is unique about emerging market and what even does growth mean from an emerging market standpoint. To us, what is special about the emerging market equity asset class is not this well-worn narrative of rising middle class consumption, better demographics, ever faster growth. For us, what is unique about emerging markets is they're less efficient and they are a more complex universe that displays more volatility 
and has significant dispersion around different dimensions. And it's that dispersion and volatility and complexity that we look to harness as a way to generate excess return in the emerging market. And we do that across three different dimensions. The first one is the stock level dispersion. And to the right hand side of this slide, you can see this stat that 75% of all the emerging market stocks in the universe move up or down by more than 40% in a given year. That is just an enormous amount of movement of the stocks in the universe. And that dispersion throws up enormous amounts of opportunity for active investors. The second dimension of version is, in our view, country matters an awful lot in investing in emerging market equities. Here I'm putting up the contribution of risk in both developed markets on the left-hand side and emerging markets on the right-hand side. What you might note is in the developed market, country is not the prevailing source of risk. Sometimes country matters the most, but other times industry matters a lot as a source of risk in developed markets, and sometimes style actually is the dominant source of risk. Things look very different in the emerging market. Country factors are by far and away the more dominant risk contributor in emerging markets anywhere between 60 and 80% of total contribution, and that's been really stable through time. Whereas styles and industries, on the other hand, make up a very small proportion of risk contribution in the emerging market. For us, we believe emerging markets are cyclical. They go through cycles of boom and bust and boom and then bust again and boom again. And the reason for that is they're very dependent and still dependent on foreign capital. And so that mean reversion that is occurring across all these different countries in emerging markets gives us an opportunity in our view to generate returns through country allocation by selling countries that are hot from an activity standpoint are booming and at the end of their cycle, in our view, and buy countries that are the opposite, that are seeing a significant sell-off and are at the earliest stages of healing from a cyclical perspective. The third dimension of dispersion we try to exploit is style leadership and style leadership changes in the emerging market asset class. Here you can see from 2017 that what leads in a style environment is different from year to year. Sometimes it's growth that is the best performing style in emerging markets. And other years, like 2018, growth is the worst performing style in emerging markets. For us, it's important that we can exploit this shift in style leadership as that third dimension of dispersion. And what constitutes the styles in emerging markets can often be quite different from what we might be used to in the North American market. Here I'm showing growth factor as one example. And if you compare the first bar on the US chart here, which is showing you the most expensive growth stocks in the US market, you can see it's very concentrated in tech, healthcare, and consumer stocks. In emerging markets, or Asia as I show here, it's much more diversified that most expensive quintile of growth stocks. And in fact, you can find exposure to all of those sectors at all different valuation levels in growth. 
So it's these three dimensions, it's dispersion around the stock, it's dispersion around the countries, and it's dispersion in terms of style leadership, which is for us what makes emerging markets so special and unique and a right ground, in our view, for return from active investment. I think it's worth refreshing for a moment before we talk about potential allocation size, why it is we invest in emerging market equities at all. Aside from the tactical considerations of where we are in the cycle and is this <laughs> the perfect time to be buying emerging markets, there's three strategic considerations, which is we usually buy emerging markets for higher return, we buy them for diversification benefit and lower correlation. And we buy them, as I've argued, as a potential source of excess return or alpha in a portfolio. And emerging markets have delivered on all three of those over time. And in our view, will continue to deliver on those three. So firstly, if you take the last 30 years together, emerging markets have delivered two and a half percent annualized return in excess of developed markets. Emerging markets have also been a source of diversification in portfolios, increasingly so as the correlations between emerging markets and the developed markets have been on the decline. They peaked in the 2000s, and have actually been declining ever since. And in our view, will continue to decline as the increased weight of domestic China stocks increase in their weight of the MSCI Emerging Market Index. And because they're so lowly correlated to what's going on in global equities, that will continue to increase the diversification benefit, in our view, of an emerging market portfolio. And then lastly is the alpha potential from emerging markets. And this holds up in the industry data in that to be a first quartile active equity manager in the emerging market category, one needs to be delivering 200 basis points of excess return on an annualized basis before fees. In the US category, one only has to be delivering 29 basis points of alpha growth of fees. So in our view, those strategic considerations of higher returns over the long run, diversification benefits, and a source of alpha still hold true today and for the future. So lastly, how is the universe evolving and how might we think about how much emerging market exposure we need. The role of Asia in particular, driven by China, has shifted dramatically over the last 30 years. Today, the regional share of GDP coming from Asia ex Japan is the equivalent of the GDP coming from North America, Europe, and Japan. So as the world is increasingly bifurcated, bifurcating along supply chains, bifurcating economically and politically, you really have these two sources of economic and geopolitical power. And perhaps that's why we're seeing some of the rising tensions that we are. Clients, be that wealth clients or institutional clients though, are usually extremely under allocated to the Asia block. They're well allocated to the North America and to a lesser extent the European block, but very under allocated to the Asia block. In fact, on the wealth side, one in three portfolios that BlackRock looks at still has no dedicated emerging market exposure at all. From an institutional standpoint, where people tend to benchmark against the weight of emerging markets in the ACQUI index, a neutral weight to emerging markets would be about a 12% weight. And most clients that we talk to perhaps have a high single digit weight 
but very few, a very, very small percentage even have a neutral or even less an overweight to emerging markets. The evolution that is happening with adding the domestic China market to the index means that emerging markets are increasing their weight in global indices and clients are getting increasingly under allocated to the emerging market block. Why are we talking so much or the industry is talking so much about domestic China right now is because it is such a large important market. The A shares listed on the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges is a nine trillion dollar market, thousands of listed securities and it's really liquid, second only to the US in terms of average daily trading volume. So it's a very significant equity market that has been largely closed and closed off to foreign investors really until 2014, where market mechanisms started to make it easier for foreign investors to get access to the domestic China market. And that really was further catalyzed by MSCI, including the China A shares in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index for the first time in 2018. What started out as a very small weight and has been increasing ever since. Wrapping up what we've talked about, in our view, there is an opportunity to take advantage of this prevailing negative sentiment around the emerging market, which is being reflected in here I show you absolute and relative valuations of emerging markets, is reflecting that pessimism and negative narrative around this asset class. In our view, there is growth in emerging markets being led by China, but also outside of China. The unique characteristics of emerging markets, if one can harness the dispersion of stock returns, country returns, and style leadership, make it a great source for alpha potential, in addition to its ability historically to deliver higher returns in developed markets and have diversification benefits in a portfolio. And then lastly is most clients are starting from an underweight allocation. So in our view, it could be a good time today to take advantage of the negative sentiment reflected in valuations, given the outlook to start to close some of these underweight to emerging markets. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it back to Sean to see what questions we might have from the audience. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I think that was very insightful and hopefully valuable to our attendees here today. Uh, so now we're gonna go to a live Q&A. So we've seen a few questions uh, in the Q&A section. If you can please submit your questions now, we'll, we'll try to get to them in the remaining a lot of time. So I have a few questions for you. Some of them kind of follow up to some of the material you've said. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned outflows in EM, and then you also mentioned maybe a neutral weight uh, being 12%. So as a capital allocator, I try to understand where other institutions are investing. So I'd like to get your sense on how allocations have changed over the years, and if you think COVID will impact that trend. The last time I certainly saw clients adding to emerging markets in a material way or starting from an overweight allocation to emerging markets was a decade ago. So what's happened over that decade is people either have actively cut their emerging market equity weight in their asset allocation decisions or they've kind of maintained their absolute weight or an absolute dollar amount in emerging markets, but as the weight in emerging markets increases, they've naturally become more underweight over that time. So there's really been quite a distinct trend towards our starting point today, which is very, very few people I meet, particularly in the North Americas, have even a 12% weight 
neutral type weight to emerging market equities and most people are quite significantly below that. So could you imagine a catalyst that would maybe drive uh, firms to allocate closer to a neutral weight? That's probably the trillion dollar question. In my experience, it takes a sustained bull market of outperformance of emerging markets relative to developed markets for those allocations to change. So we had 2017, for instance, which was a roaring bull market for emerging markets. And we saw the most new activity for adding to emerging markets at the beginning of 2018. So it takes a bit of time of proof, if you like. Most people don't want to be early. They want some proof that emerging markets can outperform. And only then in my mind will you start to get large scale shifts into the emerging markets. Of course, then the valuations won't look as attractive as they do as they do today. So that's the trade-off. Talking about outperformance, uh, in my introduction, I mentioned the S&P dramatically outperforming the EMs essentially since 07. The past six weeks have kind of gone the other way with China and EM performing pretty strongly, which you alluded to as well. Can you maybe opine on what's, what's driving some of that? And, and is maybe this an early warning sign and seeing, you know, NASDAQ turn over yesterday, is this perhaps an opportunity for some mean reversion? We think so. And as you point out, China has held up very, very well relative even to the other parts of emerging markets. So the China market is actually up year to date. MSCI China is up 4%. Emerging markets X china are actually still down 17% on a year to date basis. And a lot of the reasons for that are, as we discussed, are the strength of the recovery coming from China, the strength of the stimulus coming from China, and now actually feeding into animal spirits in terms of turnover, retail participation in the China market themselves. And that's really been the driving force of such strong relative outperformance of China. I'd like to talk a little about tech companies. So in the US, tech companies like FanMag have really grown in size, now over six trillion, a quarter of the S&P. Are you seeing similar trends in EEM? You definitely see similar trends in the mega cap tech companies. So your Alibaba's, your Tencent, you see those similar trends. And we certainly, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in those companies where we have a differentiated view. But there's also innovation in our view happening in Asia in diff across different industries. Payments is one that we see a lot of innovation coming from China, industrial automation and healthcare actually are others where we see in a, attractive innovation to get exposure to in China that's not just confined to what we might think of as the big consumer tech companies. Can you talk a little about EM and US correlation and how maybe that's changed over time, obviously talking about the diversification advantage to being EM, and maybe how did correlation or how, how much contagion effect was there kind of in the peak in certain period of, you know, March, April this year? Yeah, so taking the second part of your question, perhaps first, is in extreme risk off events, correlations go to one, certainly the correlation of emerging markets to the rest of the world goes to one and you saw exactly the same thing happen this time around. So in the worst of the sell-off, you saw emerging markets sell off even more than the S&P 500. If you take a step back from that, from just those very extreme risk-off situations, then as we alluded to, correlations over a longer term basis have been in decline. So the correlation between the US and emerging markets kind of peaked at kind of 0 0.9, 0 0.92, and is now more in the kind of 0.8, high 0.7 type ranges in terms of correlation. Going forward, we expect that to continue to decline because of this trend that we alluded to around the domestic China markets becoming a bigger and bigger portion of the MSCI emerging markets. And the domestic China markets are driven by completely different investors. China 
domestic retail investors and even the correlation between Hong Kong listed equities and domestic China A listed equities is about 0.5. So even the same stock that trades on two different exchanges in China only has about a 0.5 correlation. So as those low correlation places become a bigger part of the universe, then those correlations to the US and other developed markets should only continue in our view to decline. Maybe from a macro perspective, uh, with the growing global debt as a result of COVID, can you maybe comment on how EM countries are positioned from a debt to GDP perspective, maybe versus the developed economies? Absolutely. And this comes back to the three buckets that we kind of put, crudely put emerging markets in. And it's really that middle, it's kind of that yellow and, and red bucket, which is kind of really where this focuses your attention. And in our view, what splits countries that can rebound and recover, and there's a market opportunity to add capital versus what might look at first blush like a very similar situation, for example, in a Brazil and a Mexico, but what gives us confidence that those countries like a Brazil are going to struggle much more and we want to avoid putting capital in those countries is exactly your point about debt dynamics and debt sustainability. And places like India, Indonesia, Philippines, are, their starting point is from a much lower debt to GDP perspective. And in our view, therefore, can survive a temporary fiscal slippage because tax receipts have come down, just given the, the kind of economic decline from COVID. Whereas somewhere like Brazil or somewhere like South Africa, already the starting point coming into this was much, much higher from a debt to GDP perspective. And so in our view, they're more likely or the risk of them kind of tipping into a debt unsustainability spiral and running into the severe finance difficulties is that much higher in somewhere like a Brazil and a South Africa than it is in that middle bucket of countries. Maybe we continue that line of thinking or that line of questioning from a question from our audience from John Harvey asks that our EM is positioned uh, relative to DM, maybe if you focus specifically on the health effects of COVID? There are a lot of unanswered questions and I'm no epidemiologist in terms of the health effects of COVID but we have seen a few surprising elements which is again for all of the news that COVID would ravage the populations of emerging markets we've still seen far lower fatality rates in emerging markets than we have in developed markets. I certainly don't profess to know all of those the answers and reasons why, and perhaps we won't know for a number of years, but some of the things being kind of cast out there as potential reasons why are the demographics, the kind of younger age profile of populations, the less incidence of things like obesity and diabetes in the population, and I mean, I think the debate on weather will probably go on for a long time, but also kind of some kind of climate related reason to the spread of COVID too. So we certainly don't know all the answers, but considering that, you know, 80, 80, 85% of the world's population live in the emerging markets, and yet it's more like the flip of that in terms of where the COVID cases are in the world. So 85% of the population has 20% of the cases and 20% of the population has 80% of the cases. We talked a little about uh, the inefficiency in EM uh, as a source of, of alpha and the diversification benefits. Uh, Alex Leclerc from our audience has a question about uh, given the increase in liquidity and the high level of liquidity as you mentioned in China and China A, uh, relative to US, is that eroding some of the inefficiency and in perhaps the alpha? Perhaps over time, I guess as the narrative goes, as institutional investors become a higher and higher and higher portion of the domestic China market, one might expect some erosion of the alpha available. I mentioned that 
the alpha from an industry perspective in the emerging market category is about is 200 basis points of growth alpha to be first quarter. As context in your domestic China market, you actually have to be delivering about 500 basis points, almost two and a half times that in the domestic China universe to be first quarter. So there's so that inefficiency that you see today means there's significantly more alpha opportunity in domestic China than there is even in the more efficient of the less efficient emerging markets. And so even if that starts to decline over time, in our view, that's gonna take a very, very long time. Retail investors are still 95% of all of the trading volume in the domestic China index. And whilst that's you know, down ticked a little since index inclusion in 2018, it's been very, very, very minimal from very, very high starting levels. So we certainly, I'm sure, will keep discussing it. I expect it to be something that takes multi-decades to play out until you start to see real alpha degradation to the same level you might see in, in other areas of emerging markets. So another question from the audience from James King. I think this one's rather interesting. Um, how does BlackRock define EM? And I think this goes to you know uh, different service providers like MSCI uh, that may or may not include different countries. And you know one specifically mentioned here is South Korea, and you think of Samsung, and and that's not necessarily an EM. Can you talk about how you define it? And then maybe if you can opine on kind of reconstitution, how often that happens uh, with a yeah. country getting bumped out of the EM or bumped into it. I think this is a great point and something perhaps we all take or the kind of the perception out there is this is about wealth and that poor countries are in the emerging market index and rich countries are in the developed market index and in actual fact it's not about wealth at all I mean maybe it was at one point but it certainly isn't today you have some of the richest countries in the world on a GDP per capita basis in the frontier market index and what it is really about is market inefficiency, all of that discussion we've just been having, and the market functioning, and how similar is that to the market functionality that we're used to in the US or developed markets. So we, in terms of BlackRock's definition of emerging markets, we take the MSCI definitions, which are the most used from a benchmark perspective in this universe and for us what's important is that inefficiency and market functionality standards so for instance things like full foreign exchange convertibility things like being able to hedge being able to short things like settlement like settlement standards that we're completely used to closing auctions for example in terms of how the volume goes through the exchange and they are the things if you look at the MSCI consultation if you read why MSCI moves countries from one index to another or consults on why it might include the country that is really what they are focused on working with the regulators the securities exchanges in those countries to move towards more international standards around market functionality. And that's what we think binds this universe of emerging market countries together is you should get a higher return. You have to take a bit of high risk because your market functionality is different. And hence, in our view, it pays to have an expert in emerging markets to be the one accessing those markets for you because it is quite different from accessing, you know, just buying a stock on, a, on the US um, listed exchanges or even in Europe. Maybe it's worth commenting on Frontier as well. Maybe if you can uh, share with us BlackRock's overall view on Frontier and how you define that. Frontier, I mean, we've talked about the evolution of emerging markets and the evolution of Frontier markets has been dramatic over the last decade. To our earlier question, a lot of the biggest constituents of the frontier market index have moved into the emerging market index. At the same time, China, as we've been discussing, has an increasing, it, China is now 43% of the emerging market index. And after full inclusion of the China Asia, it could be 50% or more of the emerging market index. So you've had a complete crowding out of the smaller emerging markets in the emerging market index 
And then you've got this rump of markets kind of left in the frontier market index, which are much more illiquid and difficult to trade as a standalone asset class. So one thing we've done at BlackRock and kind of how we thought about it is we have put all of these smaller emerging market and frontier markets together. And that's what we call our forgotten 40. So you have the largest eight markets, which include China, Korea, Taiwan, India, Russia, Mexico. And they are more highly correlated to the developed world. They're, they make up 85% of your emerging market index, those eight countries. And then you've got this really long tail of what we call the forgotten 40. And so we've actually developed product that invests in that forgotten 40 as a kind of way to, for some investors looking to get the diversification benefit from those 40 countries to up the weight of those in portfolios because just getting exposure to emerging markets really down weights now those small, what you think of as frontier and what you think of as a smaller emerging market countries. Great, thank you. And maybe for my last question, maybe to sum up, for those that have not made an allocation to EM, can you maybe share your views on why one should pursue an allocation now? The setup that we see in the market right now is significant pessimism shown in both the newspaper headlines, shown in the outflows, and characterized in the historical low absolute and relative valuation of the asset class. And in our view, there's a disconnect between that prevailing negative narrative and in our view, what the future holds for emerging markets. We see growth being driven by China but also a lot of opportunity that's been really depressed in market prices outside of China, in places like India, other places of Southeast Asia, Mexico, and Russia. And so you have an interesting opportunity, I think, today, given most people are starting from an underweight, to trade against that negative sentiment, and it nearly always pays to trade against the negative sentiment in emerging markets, to increase your allocation today, taking advantage of that streak of outflows, really negative sentiment, which in our view is not an accurate picture of what the future looks like for this asset class. Great summary. I think we have reached our time limit. So I do wanna thank you, Jennifer, for presenting today. I also wanna thank Nick Winch for coordinating and BlackRock for their continued support. We'd also like to inform everyone that BlackRock will be hosting a virtual conference over two days next week and is extending an invitation to all CFA Society Ottawa members. This future forum will focus on themes and sectors impacting society and driving markets. Notable speakers include Larry Fink, Satya Nadella, and Chuck Robbins. And you may register directly on BlackRock's website at blackrock.com slash future forum. Thank you to all attendees for being here today. We hope this was a helpful event. Please do complete the survey so that we can improve for the next time and stay tuned for the links to the next few events coming. On behalf of CFA Society Ottawa, thank you all for joining us and stay well.